Welcome back to a new episode of LLM News, where I go through some of the most exciting and interesting updates around the world of AI and large language models. First up, we have this big announcement from Runway. So Runway has released previously the Gentry Alpha, which is a model to generate videos. So these short video clips, and we have seen a bunch of these video generation models. So the update here includes the image to video capability. So you give the model an image and it will render video. So we are seeing here some examples and they are focusing a lot on improving the artistic control and consistency of the generations. Something I'm noticing with some of the examples they posted is how the videos that are being generated follows the objects and the motions correctly. And that consistency is key if you really want to get the most out of these video generation models. It's following the structure of this particular sculpture. This one is really neat. You can see how it transitions from like a flower to fire and back to flower. You see that transition in and out. That's very cool. And that's about creativity, right? That's what we want. We don't want to generate what you can generate today. We want to generate new scenes and more creative type of scenes, I would say, in my opinion. This is really nice as well. It shows that it's respecting the objects and the physics of it. Here's another interesting one as well. So you see this one comes out of the water and you will see the waves around it. So the quality is not there yet, but I think it understands the physics and the objects around it. And this one is neat as well. It captures all the, the red painting of this particular structure. And you will see that there is like a time lapse here, which could be really interesting for video editing, right? These are nice effects that you would add normally to a video. This person that's walking here looks a little bit odd. So you can see this one, you can see here, it's going on the bike, gets down from the bike and then goes on. Like it's really strange. Anyway, it's not perfect, but I think it's an interesting addition to the capabilities they already had offered. This image to video will be something interesting to experiment with. Next up will be Llama 3.1. So this was the announcement from last week. In fact, this was probably the biggest announcement in the world of language models. What Llama 3.1 and this particular project really emphasizes on is the ability to use these really large models to you know, allow for fine tuning, distilling and deploying models that have very strong capabilities. And I think these type of models already closes the gap with the state-of-the-art models, the GPT-4 and Cloud 3.5 Sonnet. If you want something lightweight, 8 billion will be good. And I've seen a lot of reports on fine-tuning on 8 billion parameter model and getting really good results for a variety of use cases. The 70B, I think, is also very promising. It offers results that are close, I would say, to 405 billion. And what they're saying is that the 405 billion is really good for like distilling models and synthetic data generation, which is is what a lot of people are interested in. That's something that I'll be emphasizing on in the next few tutorials that I'll be uploading in my YouTube channel. So if you're interested in that, please subscribe to the channel and stay tuned for that. I'm not gonna go through all the details here. I've done a separate video if you're interested in learning more about this particular set of models and I'll leave a link in the description. One interesting thing from this announcement was this letter from Mark Zuckerberg. He, he mentions here different reasons why they are open sourcing the Llama tree models and what they expect that the community will do these models and how they envision this whole frontier models and how they're going to be used and for what applications. But there's a broader picture here as well, which is this competition with some of these closed LLM providers. So that's going to be something that this particular company is going to be focused on, making sure that there is a balance and that there is some open source models that are available for wider use and application. Next up, we have this major announcement from Google DeepMind and they announced the alpha proof. I already made a video about this, but the team LDR is that they proposed uh, two systems. One is called Alpha Proof and the other one Alpha Geometry 2. And these two models combined achieve four out of six problems that were solved on the International Math Olympiad competition. And they showed what they have proposed here. They use the language model to formalize the problems. And once they have the problems formalized, then they can use like reinforcement learning to perform some sort of search and do this kind of iterative learning so that the model can understand better these problems and be able to search for solutions more efficiently. Next up, we have this announcement from OpenAI. So they announced Search GPT, which is a temporary prototype, new AI research features that give you fast and timely answers with clear and relevant sources. This is a no brainer. I think OpenAI had always wanted to go for a search. Uh, this was rumored, you know, a couple of months back. And this is just a demo. Obviously, this hasn't really launched public yet, but they are launching with a small group, essentially, for receiving feedback. And this is something they are thinking about integrating into ChatGPT. Now, I've been in the search space for some time. I understand the challenge of doing search applications. Um, I'm excited about tools like Perplexity, for instance, that does search in a different way, right? It gives you answers as opposed to like 10 blue links. Curious what that 
direction OpenAI is going to take here? Are they going to do, you know, like what Perplexity does? Are they going to do their own type of search experience? OpenAI obviously has an advantage and they already have an ecosystem, right? They have millions, hundreds of millions of users using ChatGPT. So I think the fact that they are testing with small groups of users is a good idea to get that feedback because there might be specific use cases for which people want to use search when they're using ChatGPT and that ecosystem already. So that integration will be really key, right? So are we doing search in a conversational way similar to how Perplexity does it? Or is it going to be something completely different? From my point of view, and this is something I would prefer in a search engine, which no search engine does for me today, is I want to personalize search, right? So when I search, you should already have context of what I'm searching for. You should be able to know that I'm searching for specific things because I have a specific set of interests. It's a bit like a custom GPT. In this case, it will be a custom search GPT. I think if OpenAI really thinks about this and gets integration right, I think they can win really big here and they can compete with solutions like Perplexity already. They have like their image generation models, which is good for search. They have all the partnerships as well that they have been doing with all the publishers. All that information will be used to enhance the search GPT experience. So I don't count them out. I think the fact that they're taking their time to do this is just meaning that there's a lot of competition out there and they want to make sure that they get this right and that users find this useful as opposed to just another feature that didn't work. Next up is this announcement from Mistral. So Mistral also last week, I think it was right after Lama 3.1 was announced, they announced Mistral Large 2, which is their bigger model. It's a 123 billion parameter model that fits on a single H100 node. I think there was something about that from the Lama 3.1 405 billion parameter model. You can also deploy those on a single uh, server node, which is something that a lot of these companies want to do because obviously you want to make other developers and companies be able to use this. They have put all the tricks that they need to put there, like the quantization as well, which helps to make the inference much faster. And also they support like multilingual as well, which is something that Lama 3.1 is also doing, strong code and reasoning, right? Function calling and open ways also here, but it's non-commercial usage. So that will be the license that's available. So this is pretty exciting and they have made it available in the chat if you want to test it. But I've done a video about this. If you're interested, I'll link it below. Next up is this paper from NVIDIA. They are proposing to use something like a Lama tree based model for enhancing long context understanding and write capabilities. So what's the recipe that you will need to extend the context window effectively to support long context understanding and also enable some sort of RAG applications as well. So this is what they have done. They have provided some kind of recipe. And what they mentioned here in terms of results is that they demonstrate that the Lama tree chat QA 270B model achieves accuracy comparable to GPT-4 Turbo on many long context understanding tasks and surpasses it on RAG benchmark on this RAG benchmark that they're mentioning here. And this is just to show that you can take a smaller model like a 70B and sort of unlock this capability and unlock these reasoning understanding of long text, more powerful models like GPT-4 or even potentially Cloud 3.5 Sonnet. So that's really exciting. This is just a nice uh, survey on employing LLMs for text to SQL tasks. I get a lot of questions about this. A lot of people are interested in applying language models to this particular problem. You know, they have some kind of uh, database lying around. And so how do you use a language model to be able to communicate with those type of systems in an effective way so that you can leverage and gain insights into your data and so on, right? And that will be helpful for decision making. At the end of the day, this is what we want to achieve with agents, RAG systems, and so on, decision making. Although these models don't have good like planning capabilities, I would say, I think they are already really good at doing this text to SQL, meaning you present it natural language and it converts it into correct SQL statements that can interact with your data. So lots of applications can be unlocked here. And what this paper presents is like a bunch of prompt engineering techniques, fine tuning methods, benchmarks, and how all of this stuff is measured. Next up, we have this open artificial knowledge paper. So this one, there are a couple of nice data sets that are being released. And now that these models are, you know, like the 405B is meant to generate like synthetic data. A lot of people are interested in creating synthetic data, but with really high quality, right? Having those filters in place. And those are really cool efforts because, you know, those could lead to really nice open data sets that people can use to unlock certain capabilities in LLMs going forward. So that's exciting. And this is why open source makes a lot of sense because people get to use these open source models and generate data sets that can be further used to enhance other types of models that are available out there. So what they have done here is they have released a new 500 million token data set covering different domains. It was generated with LLMs like GPT-40, Lama 3. I'm guessing they're going to use Lama 
3.1 to further enhance this data set, but they're focusing on making it freely available and focus on knowledge coverage, right? To make these models have good knowledge, understanding capabilities, uh, coherence, make those models more factual as well in terms of accuracy and to better align these LLMs. This new paper presents a really cool idea. So the idea is to teach LLM agents to self-improve. Again, it's very similar to the idea of synthetic data generation, where you're using a powerful language model to generate synthetic data that you may use to further enhance the capabilities of that system. In this case, you would progressively do that. So the model looks at itself, does the introspection itself, see where it can fix its things and continues to progressively improves in an iterative way. So like it fine tunes itself on the ability to improve its own response over multiple turns with additional environment feedback. So it's an agent, it interacts with the environment, gets that feedback and further tunes itself at that particular set of problems that it may encounter. And this is neat because current agents today, they're pretty much static when they interact with an environment. You know, you may take that interaction or the result of that interaction with the environment. You may store it in a database, but then you will need to interact, create a good search engine, retrieve that information back that is the experience itself. But that information, right, is not really available to the model right away. You will have to do that search first and then provide it to the model. But I think having the capability natively supported by the language model itself, I think is a cool idea. It's similar to other ideas that have been proposed where the model can self-reflect, correct itself while it's generating uh, an answer for a specific problem. Next up, we have this nice write-up. I always like to read Chip Huyen's blogs and she's always you know, commenting on the generative AI space and what her experience has been doing and working with people and working with companies and so on that are focused on generative AI use cases. So there's always a lot to learn from a technical perspective. And what I really found interesting is that it's something that we have been also applying to for most of our use cases, like the idea of having some kind of input guardrail and output guardrail, some sort of verification and safety and having structured outputs really enhances performance of these LLMs. This idea of context construction, right? The context, the way how you optimize that and provide that to the model is really important and key to get good results. The idea of caching, making things more efficient as well, having connections to database, you know, what to write, what to store, um, you know, doing the logging, monitoring and analytics to continue continuously improve your application on your specific uh, domain. I think all of this makes a lot of sense, but I like that she goes into details, you know, what she has learned and what went bad and what went good and, you know, how to think about creating products and projects with these LLMs. So, Next up, this is one I have announced recently. So I will be releasing in the coming months a series of short LLM courses. So it, there is a bunch of topics that we will cover, right, from synthetic data generation, collecting data, you know, doing fine tuning, prompt engineering, function calling, tool usage, RAG, building responsive with LLMs, uh, building agentic workflows, and so on. So all of these, how does it all come together? I think this is the right time to develop this type of material. So I teach, as some of you may know, courses on prompt engineering and RAG systems, but I would love to be more committed and focused to, on this to create more free material as well as paid courses that people may be interested in. And this will be like on-demand, self-based courses that you will take, but at least these will be more affordable for people that are interested to learn about the world of language models and how to actually build applications in an effective and efficient way. So I'm excited about this. I'll do some announcement later in the coming weeks. Right after Lama 3.1 was announced, we had this announcement of the availability of fine-tuning GPT-4 O-Mini. So the, you can already do fine-tuning on the GPT-3.5, but now you can do it on GPT-4 O-Mini. So this is really interesting, right? Because you can do this within the playground. You basically go there and you can go to the fine tuning section and you can do this with using basically no code. Once you have a data set that's compatible with what they require, um, you can pretty much select the minimum model and do your own fine tuning. So this is something I will be experimenting with as well because I have done some experiments in the past with this particular fine tuning feature from OpenAI and I'm curious to see how GPT-4 Mini performs on some of the tasks that I do work on on a daily basis. So I'm going to do a specific video and that's so stay tuned for that. What I mentioned here is that it's available to tier four and five users and they plan to gradually expand access to all tiers. The first two million training tokens a day are free through September 23rd. So this is the right time to experiment with this. So next up, what I wanted to share is this idea of combining different LLMs for building automated pipelines. If you're using something like Cloud 3.5 Sonnet, it might have good reasoning capabilities. It might be able to solve math problems really well. It might be able to understand and generate code you know, in a nice way that's satisfactory for your application. It also has
has this feature, this artifact feature, which I really like. So let's say I were, wanted to generate or reproduce an artifact, something like this, this visual here. And I wanted to reproduce it because I want to plug in my own numbers. Let's say for something like Lama 3.1. And I wanted to put my own data points here. It's really hard to do it with just a JPEG. I'll have to do this manually. And the model process will take me a long time. What if I could just create an automated pipeline using a combination of LLMs? So I would use something like GPT-40 for its vision capabilities. And then it would explain the chart. It would explain where the generation of Cloud 3.5 failed. And I'll take that feedback and send that back to the other models. So these are models giving feedback to each other to sort of improve the model on the overall application that I would want from it. So how do you combine these models and how do they communicate effectively? And can they even communicate effectively? That's what I'm interested to figure out. And for something like this, the idea that I had was, you know, I want to create a universal sort of agent that allows me to reproduce anything that I see out there, any type of figure in whatever domain I want. And so I want to automate this whole process. But so far, I haven't had a lot of success just using one model like GPT-40 because GPT-40 fails in the code generation part. But then I know Cloud 3.5 Sonnet is really good at code generation so and is very creative in its outputs. So how can I leverage the capabilities of the two? Cloud 3.5 Sonnet's vision capability is not as good as GPT-40 in my opinion. And so how do I leverage GPT-40 for the vision capabilities and let these two models communicate in an automated way to generate charts like this? That's kind of the question. You can read more about it. I'll link it in the description if you're interested in that experiment. I'll be doing more experiments like this and sharing more on Twitter. Next up, I wanted to highlight this particular post from Andrek. Now, he always has some really cool ideas about the space. And this one is about jagged intelligence. And basically, you know, these some of these models, you know, they do very impressive tasks. They're really good at complex math problems, for instance. But they also suffer and struggle with some very dumb problems, as he stated here. And what are these dumb problems? Like questions like this, which the community have been sharing online. And I've also done a few experimentation and offered my thoughts as well. I even have a video on my YouTube about this particular example. So in this case, is 9.11 bigger than 9.9? .9, and the model says, yes, 9.11 is bigger than 9.9, .9, which is the wrong answer. But you can see with simple questions like that, it fails. It fails at this tic-tac-toe problem. You know, they have like how much letters are in barrier and it fails at that as well. And this has to do with many different aspects of this LLM, right? Like tokenization is one big one. How is this model recognizing patterns? Um, it might be biased towards a specific type of data. So this is what I mean by pattern recognition because it has seen too much of one certain type of data. In this case, in the first example, it might have seen a lot of software engineering type of data where this would be version. And if it's a version of a software, then it really makes a lot of sense. But that context is missing. This informs basically how you may address certain problems and why it's important to keep optimizing context. Like prompt engineering is still really important because that's how you would normally address some of these issues. That'll be it for this episode of the LLM News. Hopefully there was something useful for you. Let me know in the comments if there is something that you would like me to go deeper on. Thanks for watching. Please consider leaving a like and subscribe if you haven't to the channel and I'll see you in the next one.